thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now podcast, where we help career and entrepreneurial women gain the tools to develop a success mindset, create winning strategies, build collaborative relationships, and take bold action towards creating impact and fulfillment in their lives and careers. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm on a mission to awaken and activate women and emerging leaders so they can tap into their innate leadership ability, elevate their influence, and create the impact they were destined to make. If you're ready to up-level your confidence, courage, and influence, you've come to the right place. Join me weekly for insights, strategies, and resources to help you grow, develop, and embody the leader you were meant to be so that you can make the impact you know you are called to make and establish the legacy you've always dreamed. The world eagerly awaits the emergence of your brilliance, impact, and influence. So with that, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of She Leads Now. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm so excited to bring you another episode of the Lead Her Shift Reloaded series, where we are reimagining, redefining, and rehumanizing leadership. And so today I have a special guest with me, Sonia Overstreet. And so Sonia is the North American Learning and Development Manager for LEADEC and a certified performance technologist. She has over 20 years of experience in engineering, performance management, and workplace learning. Sonia holds a Master's of Science in Instructional Design and Performance Technology. She has spoken on many different platforms, including conferences for the American Society of Engineering Education and the International Society of Performance Management. With that, welcome to the show, Sonia. Thank you, Sabine. I'm so happy to be here and appreciate you taking the time to interview me. This is going to be great. Absolutely. It is. It is. Because when we get together, we can talk for hours. <laughs> um, so you have been in this space for, you know, a significant amount of time. I'm curious if you could just walk us through briefly, you know, what your career journey has been like and, and what decisions you've made that have led you to the place that you are today. Okay. Okay. So for me, I started out like way back in high school, wanting to be first an architect. And so in high school, I took some board drafting classes, you know, hand drafting classes. And then I took some class at a technical school as well. And I thought, well, you know, architects, maybe not my thing. So I went into engineering. And so I started to pursue my engineering degree. And all the while, even in high school, working part time as a what they call at the time a drafter, doing hand drafting and then also computer aided drafting. So I did that in high school. And all the while I was pursuing my engineering degree, I first did earn a associate's degree at a technical institution. Louisville Technical Institute at the time in Louisville, Kentucky, and then went on to pursue my four year bachelor's degree in engineering. Uh, again, still working part time as a computer aided design drafter. So with that, I was at Kentucky State University. They have a three two program where you do your your general studies at Kentucky State, and then you do you pres- you earn your engineering degree from that partner school. And I applied to Ohio State University, moved to Columbus, Ohio to attend OSU, and again working at the time full time. <laughs> in engineering. And when I was at one of the engineering firms, I started to notice the difference between how the departments related to one another. And I got kind of tired of doing the drawings and wanted to get more into the business aspect of it. So I switched majors and switched schools. Instead, I went from Ohio State, the Ohio State University to Otterbein University. And that's where I earned my bachelor's in organization communication. And all the while, it was really a planned action. I didn't take things by chance. I looked at where I wanted to be, what was going on in the environment that I was, and where I could really apply my talents most. And I think because I had always been doing the drafting part-time when I was in high school and then full-time when I was in college, also taking full-time classes, I started to gain a little bit more understanding of the business. And then I wanted to do more on the business side of things. 
and really I still love the technical aspects of and the just the technical aspect and the engineering part of it. So that's why I'm still in that field, but doing things a little bit different. Yeah. What an interesting background. I didn't know that you started off in the engineering space. And so you've literally been in a technical environment, um, more so or more so like male dominated environments throughout your entire career. And so now that you're in the learning management side of things, how is your ability to understand the technical side being applied to how to actually support the employees from an L&D perspective? The experience that I have, you know, from way back starting out in the technical field, and just a little side note, I've only had two jobs that weren't in the technical space. One was my very first job when I was 16. I worked at Arby's at the at Basham Mountain Mall in Kentucky. And then my second job, no, actually three. The second one was I was the night financial aid receptionist at the technical school I attended during the day. And then I did national service with AmeriCorps. So those were my, throughout my entire career, those were the only times that I did not work in the technical field. And one of the things that I love about it is just being able to think critically. I love that. And then knowing, having that throughout my career, now that I'm in learning and development, still in the technical space, right now I'm in in a company that works in manufacturing. It helps me to connect really well with the subject matter experts. I can understand how they talk, how they relate to things, how they put their work together, because I've done some of that work myself. I've done a lot of that. And when you're in that technical field, a lot of those those concepts translate from any technical field, whether it's civil engineering, which when I worked there at a civil engineering firm or doing mechanical drafting when I did that or doing in the manufacturing space, the, the concepts really are similar. So I have a really good connection with the subject matter experts because I've done some of the things that they currently do. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm sure that that has really benefited you because I know even when I was in HR and especially when I first started in HR, like I got I kept being told that the most impactful or influential HR leaders are the ones who understand the business, are the ones who can see mm-hmm. to the business, not just the business results, but actually like, how do we make money? Like, how do we make the widgets? Mm-hmm. And so I'm sure that that it sounds like it has served you in being able to, you know, one, relate to the individuals within the organization. And then two, as you're creating programs and you're creating development opportunities for them, like you can do it, like almost like putting yourself in their shoes and what would be valuable to them. Is that correct? That's correct. And it it really brings a lot of credibility to the work that I do. And my approach to learning and development is very structured. So the way that my department puts together programs and we're working with subject matter experts, we have a process. We have a methodology of the way that we approach our work and specifically dealing with subject matter experts from the technical background, they can really appreciate it because most technical fields, they have very strict and rigorous processes that they follow to do their jobs, whether it's of course is engineering or manufacturing or even architecture. There's there's some there's certain principles principles that they follow. And then I can relate to them because I've been in that world. And then in the L&D space, I follow rigorous principles myself of how we put together our curriculum, how we, this number one, the needs assessment, we always do that first, what is the need? And we talk through that with the subject matter expert so we can just understand what is really happening and is training, pure training, the answer, or is it another intervention that will help them either remove obstacles or decrease whatever gap that they're currently experiencing? So with that technical background, and then having that that solid methodology and p- learning principles that we apply to our work that brings a lot of credibility, gives us a lot of credibility with our subject matter experts that we partner with. Yeah, I'm sure. And it, I, I just felt like the, the need to take a moment, right? Because, you know, oftentimes 
L&D gets like lumped into HR, right? So people from the outside, mm-hmm. like HR, and then maybe they'll refer to it like as training if it's a separate, depending on the size of the organization, if it's a separate department. Um, but as we've seen in these last couple of years, the space has been really created for more L&D professionals to step into the limelight because essentially they're the ones behind the the development right of the teams regardless mm-hmm. of what, what focus they're on and more and more as we've seen the workforce has been asking for more development more training more opportunities to grow more opportunities to develop so you you the the function itself right or the department has been thrust into the limelight so share with us a little bit about and it doesn't necessarily have to be with your company but at, from an industry perspective, what are some of the changes and some of the shifts that are happening within L and D, and how are they responding to this like increased demand for their services and their expertise? This is a great question. I love it, and I can't wait to talk about it. There have been so many changes in the space, particularly you know, particularly around in like. 2020 with the whole pandemic thing it was all about how are we going to continue to connect with our employees develop our employees onboard our employees keep them up to date with technology and all these things being remote so lnd really got this spotlight we were like under the spotlight this intense spotlight of like get it done you know and then prior to that in some cases in some organizations L&D was kind of in on the back burner. They were back there. We just tell them to do a PowerPoint for us. They'll get it done. And that was it. So I was at a conference um, just um, last month. And we I was on a panel and we were talking about leadership and, and L&D leadership. And one of the biggest things that I was talking about, and it came up with the audience too, is my concern that now that we're getting past the pandemic, things are starting to go back to the way that they used to be. With L&D, okay, you did a good job during the pandemic, thank you, but now that's it. And it's like, nope, not not, not quite, <laughs> we're, we're not gonna do that. And it's really about how do you hold that attention with your stakeholders in the business? And the thing that I talk about a lot and talked about during that, that panel session, for L&D leaders, to think of yourself more as a business leader with L&D expertise and not just a learning leader only. So that's a, you're a business leader. You bring a great amount to the organization with your learning expertise. And that's one of the things I feel that is lacking and with a lot of people is that in the space is that you really don't have, they really don't have a concept of how business works. And I think that comes back to your point of L&D getting lumped into HR and not really being a standalone, whether it's in just being tagged as training and a lot of times just compliance and not really being a partner to other business leaders. So that's that's one of the ways that I feel that you can really maintain your seat at the table, as people like to say, of really understanding the business and bringing business solutions, not just learning solutions, but things that are going to move the business forward. And when I talk to, like, for instance, when I talk to folks in my organization now or other organizations where I was the learning and development manager, they would say, call me up and say, hey, Sonia, could you help me with training? I always say yes. And then my next question, my next statement is, hey, can I ask you a couple of questions? Because a lot of times what the person is asking, they have a need and they think training is going to solve it. But it's my responsibility as a business leader and learning leader to walk them through that needs analysis to see, is there another intervention other than training, setting people down with a PowerPoint that will actually solve your problem? And if you are solving business problems and moving the business forward, that will keep you in the spotlight. That will keep people coming back to partner with L&D. Absolutely. Absolutely. A couple of things. First of all, I love that that shift in perspective, right? That you are a business partner in every way and that you're leveraging your expertise in L&D to be able to solve that problem. Same thing with 
talent acquisition, right? Or recruiting, mm-hmm. right? The business problem is we need people to do the work and you leverage the recruiting to be able to fill that. You know, as I'm thinking through, of you know, many of the demands that have come through in the last couple of years, right? There's been a huge demand for upskilling leaders, like present day leaders in terms of how they approach leadership. There's been a huge demand for creating programs to develop new leaders coming into the organization. And then there's certainly been a a shift in terms of helping the entire workforce redefine how they do work and how they get things Mm -hmm. done in such a like remote or hybrid environment. So of those three, like where are you seeing from an industry perspective, where are you seeing the opportunity for L&D professionals to provide the most value? I think one of the things that happened, particularly for not just my organization, but for other organizations, in whether, you know, when it were really um, technical fields, it was that it's the mindset that you have to be in the office working in order for people to know that you're doing work. So it was it was a lot of resistance to going remote in some in 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 some cases. I know some of my friends who still work in engineering, it was like a hard sell and they and it wasn't until there was like mandates that you cannot go into the office did the did the organization really have that light bulb moment that uh oh, we got to do something. And the the surprising thing is work still got done. You know, so I think there's still this this overall idea that people have to be in the office, that you have to see people working in order to, you know, they have to be at their desk for you to think that they're working. And that's not the case because people can still not work while they're at work, you know. And I think that's one of the areas that L&D really made some inroads is to say that just because we're remote, does not mean that work can is not happening and that doesn't mean that development is not happening. But the thing about that, it depends it really depended on how you define how your your learning and development department defined development. Because for me, one of the things that I tell people, and you can see it on my LinkedIn profile, because it's my background picture, is I have my motto: learning and development is not just training, it's performance improvement. So if you're not doing something that is improving somebody's performance, particularly in the in business, then what's the point? So when we, my team developed, had to move remote, and this was on my five-year strategic plan anyway, was to bring more hybrid and remote learning into, into our organization. And we were forced to do it with the pandemic, so that just hastened it. But what it really did is helped us connect people to the idea that you can develop and grow in different ways in the organization. It doesn't have to be static. It doesn't have to be the same old stuff where you have the subject matter expert in a conference room. Everybody come down. They listen to it. They have a hundred slide deck that they go over. Great information. But were you really going to remember all that stuff? So I think for us, the biggest opportunity that I take away from all the upheaval and disruption during the pandemic is people having people open their eyes to learning and development can happen in a multitude of ways. It can happen face-to-face. I still love the face-to-face in person. It can happen via Teams or Zoom. It can happen um on demand with LinkedIn Learning. We have that platform. We use that extensively. Or it can happen with self-study. There's a lot of different ways that you can grow and develop in your career, but the L&D team really has to be in the forefront pushing those things. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, as as you were sharing, I, I remember way back when, and I've shared this before, you know, there was the whole talk of like 2020, 50% of the workforce would be eligible for eligible for retirement and certainly engineers at the space because I used to work for an engineering company that that Mm -hmm. was that was the prep work right and so now you're in an environment where you are surrounded by those people with technical expertise who are now leaving the organization there's a lot of knowledge that that is leaving the organization and not necessarily being transferred um, in many ways Mm -hmm. some companies haven't maybe they didn't expect, well, first of all, 2020 
was not what any of us expected. <laughs> uh, but certainly, you know, you've had a lot of knowledge exit the door. And so I would imagine that this is a this is also while it's an exciting time for L&D professionals, it's also a challenging time because now it's it's almost like okay, we're trying to plan for the future, but there's so much institutional knowledge that mm-hmm. is no longer available. So how are you again, this is this is general perspective mm-hmm. like how do you as a leader in the space kind of create something <laughs> that allows you to support the organization. Cause I see that as a, as a huge business problem as well. Is that a focus in the industry? Is that something that you, you guys got locked down? What does that look like? It is a focus for a couple of things. So number one, you're correct. So we, we do have a lot of folks leaving the industry on, you know, retiring out of the industry. And then also we have difficulty getting people, younger people into the industry, particularly in manufacturing, because I think there's still that stereotypical view of what manufacturing is. You know, it could be that, you know, old, gloomy, dirty, factory floor, you know, hazard prone and all that stuff. And that's not the case. That's that's not how things work now in the industry. There's so many, there's so much technology, robotics, AI, everything going on in these these facilities that would just kind of blow your mind. So that's one of the obstacles that we do have is really getting people to really understand what the factories or the facilities and and manufacturing plants look like today. One, a couple of things that we can do, and this is one of the things that we're pursuing where I'm at now, is different types of opportunities for internships, partnering with local two-year colleges, technical schools to get people into the industry. There's a lot of national organizations that do that very well you know, really of reaching out to students about skilled trades, whether it's in manufacturing, carpeting, all of those things, those hands-on skills and those 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 trades that we need, that we need all the time. Everybody needs it, but we really don't think about it very often. And those those I am a big proponent of technical education and skilled trade because you can have a great career in those fields. And really connecting with with our national organizations that do that. One of the companies that I work for, we had a really good program where we had retirees. I worked with them to come back. They came back into the organization on a part time basis to do the training and for our new engineers coming in. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. It just really depends on your organization, what your need really is, and then how do you facilitate that transfer of knowledge? And I've seen a lot of different programs, been a part of a lot of different programs that work successfully, and just figuring out what is best for where I work now to to move that forward, because it is something that, and, and I, I think about this all the time, of why is it that it's so hard to get people to see that they can have a very good career in particularly manufacturing and I think it's just those hang that that hangover of just thinking of it as the factory or these old plants in the 60s or maybe 70s or something but there's there's so many things that have come so far with the technology it is amazing when I've I walk through some of these plants I've gone on some site visits and it's just amazing what is what is inside these facilities and what people can do. Absolutely. I used to work for aerospace, a company, and I remember going Mm -hmm. to Frankfurt, Germany, actually, because I know about in Germany and um, and walking through and really seeing like how these like parts for the planes that we get on every single day were being made. And it was just it was mind boggling. Um, so mm-hmm. you're right. Like, you know, the the vision of like stark, holy people are miserable, like things are all mm-hmm. over the place. That's definitely not true. Um, but you bring up a really great point in terms of how do we create more awareness, right, for this particular industry. And for so long, for decades, right, the focus was go to a four-year school, go to a four-year school. Yep. And we know not everyone could afford a four-year school. Not everyone was mm-hmm. you know, had access to that. 
And so we, it's almost like as a society, we did a disservice to a generation in terms of not exposing them to trade schools and technical schools and being able to, you know, learn something specific that could translate. Um, And so I've, I've heard a couple of different organizations have really been proactive in partnering with two-year schools, trade schools, um, technical Mm -hmm. schools to be able to drive more talent in to fill that pipeline as the boomers are exiting. Um, But I'm curious, what does that look like from a, a, we're we're talking about women in leadership, right? What does that look Mm -hmm. like from a woman's perspective? Like, what are the, what are the statistics around how many, and you don't have to give me specifics, but like, what, what are some of the thoughts around how do we get more women? excited about this particular field and leveraging their skill sets and their zones of genius? Well, that's another thing, too, because um, we we have, um, we just started, last year we started an internal group, Women in manuf- LEADAC Women in Manufacturing. And just looking at some of the stats with the, you know, the uh, Bureau of Labor, is that women really are underrepresented in manufacturing. And definitely the the numbers went went down, decreased dramatically, you know, when women left, a lot of women left all kinds of industries during the pandemic, you know, because they were typically the ones that would stay home when the kids were out of, out of school and all that. But the numbers are coming back up, but they're still not not as high as, as we would like. So a couple of things that are happening with some of these organizations, there's a national women in manufacturing, a lot of national organizations doing some great things around women in STEM careers, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So there are there are some great things going on. But for me it's it's a little bit it's a little bit different because for me, I started out doing this in high school. I always had in my mind first, like I said, architect and then engineering. So, and and going back to when we were talking about trade schools, when I, I had, at high school, I had all my credits and everything, so I could do half day at a technical school, and I elected to do that because that's where I would get graded drafting. At the, at the high school, it was only board drafting, hand drafting. At the tech school, I could do it on computer, so I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to prepare me, and I was, in effect, reprimanded by some of the teachers there saying they told me that I was, and I'll quote them, too smart to go to tech school. That was for people not, I'm like, so in my mind, my mind, I'm very, I'm a very um logical person, right? So in my mind, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because if I'm able to learn computer aided drafting, which I know that that's the future of the industry, why would I stay at high school to take French too <laughs> when I can learn computer aided drafting? So it's I think it's still that idea that this kind of technical or trade is for people who are not as smart, but these, it's, it, it blows my mind that we still have that. And then two, for even women, it's like, okay, then, so you get the one thing where for some people it's like, okay, you're too smart to go to a tech school. And then on the other side, you get like, eh, a girl, can you really do that? Can you really do math? I'm like, okay, this is crazy. So you kind of get it from both ends. But for me, just saying, just being determined, like, okay, I don't care what anybody says, I'm doing this. And then when I see that as I've moved through my career, and, and it's it's very evident because when you're working in, in different different organizations, that there weren't a lot of women, you know, colleagues in in these in these fields so it's just one of those things it's like how can we then move this forward and I think the biggest thing is just giving people opportunity I think that's the biggest thing is people having the opportunity and know that they can pursue this if they want to pursue it yeah yeah I had a I had another guest on and she is she works with a lot of organizations and she works with women of color, particularly who are trying to enter into STEM or at least advance in their careers. And one of the things that she shared was like, you know, in the industry overall, there's like that one to three year period, right? So 
there's a challenge of getting people in in that one to three year period. But she also mentioned that there's this um, there's a space in which if after the three years, like you have not advanced, people kind of get stuck there. And in particular, women get stuck there. And so it becomes this when you look at the pipeline for leadership opportunity, Mm -hmm. it looks limited because there aren't a lot of people in there. But really, if you look at the that one to three year pool, if you will, you'll see a lot of women, you'll see a lot of young people. So and again, no right answers here. So from a, a L&D perspective, or even from a business leader perspective, how do we shift that narrative? And how do we shift that, um, that way of being and that way of doing things so that we can open up the gates, so to speak, to allow mm-hmm. more people to move past that three year, three year mark into higher levels within the organization? One of the things that I've talked about and and even at the conference I was at on the panel is because they had asked the question of like, how did you get here? You know, how did you get to be a leader? And one of the things I told them, it was planning. I planned it. During my career, I planned certain things. So in that one one to three year, the thing is, I tell people, it's you have to be in control of your career. You have to take 100% responsibility of your career. So you can't wait to the organization decide something about your career. You can't wait to your manager or any of that. You have to be in control of that. Because one of the things people, it's so funny, one of the things I think happens is when we get into organizations, we think, okay, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to do the best. And then I will be promoted because people are know because I'm working hard. And I'm like, no, nah, that, that's kind of not the case <laughs> because you can be working hard and people appreciate the hard work, but they don't even know you. So you have to be in control of that career. What are your career moves? What do you want? And also with that, talk to your manager about that. Because we have this assumption that, our, you know, I'm working hard, I'm getting good reviews, and my manager is going to know I want to be promoted. It's like, if, you, if your manager also has five or six other team members, they cannot think of everything each one of you want. So it's up to you to say, Mr. and Ms. Manager, this is what I see. This is how I've been performing. This, what are my next steps? This is where I want to be. Can I get there? What are the steps to get there? You have to be upfront about what you want in your career. And in some cases, that will that will get you on the move. But then in other cases, you'll find that maybe it is. You are going to be stuck. Well, then if that's the case, at least you know. So then you can either leave that organization or be satisfied with where you're at. But if you don't know, if you haven't communicated what you want, to the people who can help you get there, then you're you're probably never going to get there. And that's one of the things I say, be in 100% in control of your career and plan what you want to do and where you want to be. Because if you don't have a plan for yourself, it's highly unlikely somebody else is going to have a plan for you. You may get like super lucky and somebody say that they have a plan for you, but I, I'm i not the person to leave things up to luck, particularly when it comes to my career. So I would say for the for folks, women, men, whomever, young people, if there are things you start to think early about what you where you want to be in your career and start making plans for that and then talk to the people who are the stakeholders or could get you to who have the influence to get you to that next level and see where you stand with them because I like to understand where I stand and I like to understand if I'm going to be able to move in the organization or not and then it's up to me to make the decision whether I stay or go right right yeah I mean you so many great points. I remember when I first came into corporate America, I was told like you own your own career and you own your own Mm -hmm. development, which was probably like the best advice that I I got being so young in my career. But it also meant, I don't, I don't know what that means. (laughs) Like, what does that mean? (laughs) And I'm, I'm grateful that I, I started in HR because in HR or, you know, any, any capacity within that function, 
you get to see things, right? Like you get to see mm-hmm. the impact and moves and, and often are part of the decision. But I often wonder if I had started in like some other part of the business, would I have known, right? That like, oh, you you find mentors, you figure out, you know, who is your champion or who is your sponsor? Like who are the people who are speaking about you? And even my first couple of years, I would say I had that mentality, put my head down, work hard, they're going to mm-hmm. notice me. Until I kept seeing Bob, James, Mark, (laughs) and all the other ones like rising up. And I was like, wait a minute, something's not, (laughs) the math is not mapping here. Something is not adding up and they're doing something different that I'm not. And so through observation, I was just like, oh, okay, I need to make sure that I'm scheduling or creating a relationship with my manager's manager so that I can schedule formal skip level meetings, right? Mm -hmm. Or that I am in, I'm raising my hands for projects, cross-functional projects that give me exposure to other people outside of the organization. It was just like, it was this thing that I I had to muddle through, right? Not having, Mm -hmm. um, not having any examples, right? Being the first the first to graduate, first to work in corporate America and whatnot. And so I think the advantage to this generation or these generations who are in the workforce, there has been enough of us like learning the hard way to be able to communicate this. Um, but oftentimes you can still get into an organization and feel feel lost, right? And especially as women, yes. we, we, we've talked about this before, right? You're coming into an environment, you have your own self-doubts, you have your own concerns, and you're looking around and maybe people don't look like you, or maybe you're the only woman in the room, or you're facing these um, situations in which you just are questioning yourself. So what, what advice would you give to the, the woman or the, the newbie who is coming out fresh out of college, early career, they're really, really excited. They know they have what it takes, but the environment around them doesn't necessarily reflect who they are. And so they might fall mm-hmm. into that space of questioning, am I good enough? Questioning, do I have what it takes? And, and we, I, I know how much you love the word imposter syndrome. When they're dealing with their own imposter syndrome, like how do they push past that to be able to get to the place where they are taking ownership and control over their career and they're making decisions to lead them where they want to be? So a couple of things. So number one, I uh, I do believe that the org- organizations do have a responsibility to really help new people new hires get started out on the right foot and it's not necessarily like with the with the orientation it's not necessarily all the computer systems and everything that you'll need to use it's really orienting them to the business so that's one of the things that we we try to do from an L&D perspective or because we have part of the new hire orientation it's about how do you get started on the right foot now that you're in a new business. So now you have fresh opportunity to show to show up how you want to show up as a professional. You have a number of opportunities to now meet new people and connect. And how do you do that in LeadX world? And what does that look like? How can you do that remotely? Because we all, a lot of us work remotely. We don't get together very often. So we do a lot to orient people to the business and really how they can, can connect to folks being new to the organization. Because it's not something that is innate. You don't just, you don't just automatically know these things. So if you're new to the organization, if you're like fresh out of college, you probably don't know how business works. And then each organization has its own particular culture. So you may have done an internship at one business where the culture was a particular way. And it's totally different when you get a full time job at another organization. So. Again, I think the 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 there is some ownership on the organization to help people acclimate and then for individuals. Getting, we all, I think everybody has some nervousness when they start something new and when they're meeting new people and how do they get started right? How do they make those connections? And really just taking the time to, number one, don't be anybody other than yourself because that, that will blow up instantly. <laughs> that never works out. It's just really understanding the, I think the best way to get connected with people in this organization 
is knowing yourself, knowing what what your core is, knowing your values, knowing what you want, and then seeing how that can be a value add to the business. That's a big thing. I think that sometimes we we always we we're trying to make ourselves into something or somebody that we're not to fit into an organization. And it's like, no, because you you can't sustain that for a long period of time. You just can't, you can't be somebody you're not to meet a particular idea. You cannot do that for long term. Because what it end up happening, what I think a lot of times things happen is that you get angry, you get depressed, you get demotivated. There's a lot of things that happen to people in organizations when they're trying to be someone that they're not. So for me, and what I the, the biggest advice I would tell people is to know, go in knowing who you are and then see if that matches up with the core of the business, with the values of the organization. If it doesn't, that's fine. If fine, if it doesn't, then you can try to find somewhere else. But the biggest thing is knowing who you are so that you have that that compass for yourself that you don't get distracted and you're 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 more able to connect with people on an authentic basis if you're true to who you are and then people i think for the most part people connect with that i I know we think things are a lot like kind of really scary in business particularly if you're like one of the only or very few but when you are yourself more often than not, people will connect with that than more like more often than you think that they would. Because I think we we in our minds we put up a lot of barriers ourselves of, you know, maybe people won't like me because I look like this or I'm this age or I didn't, I don't have this degree. But typically, you know, you'll find some some crazy people. But in general, what I found is that it is it generally is true that we can have we have more things in common than we don't. And if you start with that basis, then typically you're going to get much further than you ever thought that you would. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you you make a very valid point because that the the focusing on who you are, what your values are, like what's important to you, getting to the core of that, you know, doing leadership coaching, that's where I start with, okay, who are you, right? And and most leaders <laughs> have a very hard time answering that question. And it's because, you know, if you look at how we're, how we're groomed into society and what, you know, what is okay, it, it, there's no point in our lives where we're given permission to take a step back and say, who am I? What do I want? Outside of what my parents wanted for me or outside of what my teacher or my friends or whatever, who am I and what's important? And so, you know, you get into the workplace and you just assume, oh, these people are adults. They know who they are. They know what they want. They know what's important (laughs) to them. And 20 years later, they're like, no, actually, I don't know. I was just following the path that I thought Mm -hmm. was the right path. And I was doing the thing that I thought I was supposed to do. And so 2020, right? And I know people are tired of hearing this, but it's it's still <laughs> it was still such a game changer. It created the space for people to really mm-hmm. sit down and have that mirror moment, that honest moment with themselves. Like how much of my life right now today is reflective of other people's expectations and other people's wants and how much of it is reflective of me? And so I think as people really took the time to dig deep into that question, that's when you saw the mass exodus. That's when you saw the, Mm -hmm. like, I'm changing, right? It wasn't the, you know, it wasn't just, well, I mean, obviously the demands on their time shifted as well. But what we're seeing today, you know, two years out at the time of this recording from the pandemic is people having that moment, that light bulb moment. And there are still a lot who are still trying to figure it out, which is cool, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But collectively, as a as a human race, I feel like it was such a gift for us to have that space and for us to do the work for those of us who did it. But certainly, um, you know, it, it's really I feel like it's created space for people to align with who they are so that they could then align with work that reflects who they are. Um, and now, obviously, that has put a, a big demand on organizations 
because now you can no longer check who you are at the door. First of all, you're not walking through a door. And secondly, <laughs> now you now understand this is who I am. This is what's important to me. And I want to be aligned with an organization that values that. And I want to be around people who value that. And you make a good point. One of the things, too, is the whole idea of leadership. When you get into organizations, it's like when you look on a job description, be a team player, great at communication. OK, well, you know, great. Well, well how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, community like if you say, oh, be a great communicator or be a great leader. How, how do you do that? What does that mean? That means different things to different people. And then like in some cases, when you get promoted, you get, okay, you go from not, you know, being a, what we'll say, an individual contributor to a manager. Now you have team members under you that you need to manage or guide or direct. And from one position to another, you never got any new knowledge. You just got a new title. So it's like, then you're, you're, how do you perform? But the organization, that's why I go back to my, I, my thought is that organizations, we do have, organizations do have a responsibility to help people acclimate number one to the organization and the new positions that they're in. And one of the things that my team is doing, we're doing a lot of development and programs for our line managers, you know, who were promoted and probably never really got a lot of formal development. And so what we're doing is trying to do develop programs that intensify as you move up. So if you're a supervisor, here's one set of skills that we know of in, the, in our organization that will, will benefit you in this position. When you move to the next position, here's another program, here's another set of skills that you can grow and develop in. So we're trying to do though a little bit more of a pathway of success for people with programs so that we don't get to the point that they are senior leaders and really just gain knowledge kind of happenstance, you know, just kind of fell into things. Stop having people fall into things. If you have business leaders who have expertise in learning, let them do that and develop programs so that people can feel confident about in their role, about how they're performing, and really have some long-term lasting careers within your organization. I think one of a lot of things organizations have done is just try to do things, you know, by chance and there's just think people are going to automatically know things. No. But what I tell people when when I'm working with with folks who have some whatever issue that, you know, they want some support with, I remember telling one manager we we talked about it, it's like, well, how long did it take you to earn number one, your degree. And then when you started in business, when you started working, how long did it take you to really be proficient? So we walked through that. And then I asked them, then why then are you asking a, a new hire who just graduated to be 100% proficient within 30 days? That's not realistic. You know that, I know that, because it didn't happen for us, and it's not going to happen for them. But sometimes in business, we kind of forget the road that helped, you know, our road to success and where we where we currently would be are, and we just expect things too quickly from folks and not giving them the time, the the tools, and the resources to really be proficient and develop in their jobs. And that's a great point because I, I always talk about how, you know, the, the middle manager is like the most underserved, right? Because they have the demands to perform, the demands to hit whatever the, the bottom line numbers are. And then they're still trying to figure out how to like support all of these individuals mm -hmm. that support into them. Um, but that that the, the example that you gave was such a, a great highlight to this is what this is the pattern that we've been operating under. And now we're all looking at it like it doesn't work. And we're wondering why, <laughs> why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's never worked. It, it, it's never been fair to individuals coming into an organization to be tasked with things um, and then not given the support. But at the same time, I think the value or the thing that makes organizations valuable or being able to meet their goals is that they've created the structure where it's like it's sink or swim. 
right? Like Mm -hmm. I I worked for a company and that's exactly what it was. It was sink or swim. And for those who were able to swim, oh, you, you kept riding, but it doesn't mean that you were swimming with the the right fins or the right (laughs) that you needed. You just figured out how do I get enough stuff done to Mm -hmm. not, you know, not drown which is unfortunate. And I know that that's not reflective of every culture or every environment. Um, but certainly as we're, as we're seeing this shift, it's, it's very important. I think it's very important for leaders to really take that step back and look at, okay, what was my experience? And then how do I completely shift that around to make it not necessarily easier, but make it smoother for the, for the next round? Because really when people are up and running, that's when you get the productivity, right? When people mm-hmm. feel connected to the work, when they feel connected to the mission, they have the tools, they have the resources, like we're we're naturally going to churn out um, product regardless of what that looks like. But I feel like it's like a lot of organizations are, are taking that step back to be like, oh, so you're not a good leader. Like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't give you any development tools. I didn't give you any coaching. I didn't give you any training, um, but you need some help. And I also see the same thing on the HR side too, right? So overall HR function as we've transitioned and as we've evolved um, now in this space, there's a higher demand of for HR professionals and how they show up. And so now it's kind of like, oh, we've kind of abandoned HR or better yet, HR was so busy trying to support the business that they didn't put in tools and resources for themselves. And now that back work is being done to say, okay, if HR is going to be the one who's carrying the business, because they are, if HR is going to be the one carrying the business, then we need to give them the support, the tools, the resources that they need to be able to do so effectively. Yeah. So when I look at it from a learning and development standpoint, I look at it as if the if the individuals are growing and developing and applying their new skills, then their team is. If their team is, their division, their department is, if the department is, then the region is. And then that just goes up globally. One of the things that we do with a couple of exercise, well, one exercise in particular that we do at our new hire orientation, a couple of things is your, we do impact circles. So everybody, whichever new hire is in our orientation, they do impact circles. And that is your job. What is your job? What is your role? Whether it's L&D, accounting, operations, whatever it is, what is your impact to the business? So that first circle, that first level of impact typically could be to your team members or to the internal customer or external customers that you serve. And then that next level of impact would be to your business unit, you know, because you're making profit for the business unit. That next level of impact is for our region. And then that next level is globally for our our company globally to succeed. And when we do those impact circles, particularly with new hires first coming in and they've they've probably been with the company for about a month or so before they do the orientation is they see how their individual contribution benefits the organization and contributes to all of our success if we ta- if we start taking people out of the whole then we have gaps in what we can when we're able to do. And I think that's what has happened with organizations when they focus so, so intently on the bottom line, they start to see not not the people that work for them, that work in the organization, but entities, you know, and it's like those, you know, okay, okay, if we take this person out or that person, you can't take, or if this entity is, no, these are people. <laughs> we are all human beings and we all have a desire I have not met a person that desires to do poorly. <laughs> you, everybody desires to do well, and if we ta- if we don't if we don't recognize that and we don't build that into our culture in organizations, that's when your organization is not going to be successful. Now, and you can be you can be successful like financially for quite some time, but culturally you won't. You will have high turnover. You will have people disgruntled. You will have people that are disengaged. You will have some functions that do very well, some functions that do poorly. So you hope that the functions who do very well can cover for the functions who are doing poorly. So you have all that when you disconnect the people 
from the success of the business. When you're just looking at dollars, you see entities. When you're looking at a a really well-functioning business, you see that you have people working for you, working and contributing to your organization. I love that. Thank you for that reminder. And that that's the part of the rehumanizing leadership, right? I want to be mindful of your time here. And so we'll go real quick through this blitz section. So sure. as you think about your career and all the decisions that you've made that have led you to where you are today and facing the challenges that you're facing, but also, you know, rising to it, if you could go back to a younger version of yourself and give her a piece of advice, what would that be? I would say, do not make time your enemy. Work with time and not against time. The reason why I say that is looking back at my younger self, I had some great ideas, things that I really wanted to do, but because I tended to be very impatient and wanted them right away. But when I when I started to realize, okay, it takes time for some some things to develop and it takes time for me personally to develop. So an idea that I had in my 20s, and it's so funny, this is, oh my gosh, the idea that I had time in, in my 20s, I did not see fully realized into my 30s. And it was perfect timing because between 20s and 30s, the a lot of things have changed. I learned, I grew, I matured, things around me, technology around me expanded. All kinds of things changed and grew and developed that that now in my from, from 20s to 30s, that was the time. And not to be, the, because if, you, if I started, if I was continuing to make time my enemy, I would get really upset and probably throw away that dream. It's not going to ever happen. But it's like, no, let me, let me work with time and understand time and start to see things happening in a different way. So then when I was able to realize certain things in my 30s, I could easily go back and connect the dots and see how time really worked those things out because they were just not, it just wasn't the right time for those things to happen. It was the, in my 20s, it was the time to have the vision. In my 30s was the time to actually see that vision realized. I love that. I was just thinking of like, I, that. that's still me sometimes today. But it's like, <laughs> oh, I put, I put a seed in the ground and I'm going to go back, check back tomorrow to see like, is it fully bloomed? <laughs> um, we know that. We know it doesn't happen. We see these examples in nature. But yet when it comes to us, it's kind of like, why is it happening? Why isn't it happening? Um, but one key thing that I love that you said is that, you know, even if it is taking longer, don't lose sight of the vision. Don't let, don't allow the the weight, if you will, or Mm -hmm. the taking period to cause you to abandon or to let it go. And one of the things I use, you know, when I get caught up to, I have a phrase that I have printed around is um, let wisdom prevail over impatience. Mm -hmm. So anytime, I mean, I use that all the time, anything that I feel like I'm, I'm like trying too hard at, I try to stop that immediately and say that and just settle down and let it go and just just work at it with consistency versus speed. Yeah. I'm adding that to my I'm adding that to my board here <laughs> of reminders. Thank you. As you think about your legacy, right? So obviously you you you've been building, you've been growing, you've been supporting many others in terms of their growth and their development. You know, when you when you think ahead, right? And not too far ahead, but when you think ahead and you you look back and you look at, or you think about the narrative that you want to be shared about you, or even the narrative that you want to be able to share about yourself, what does that look like? So the way that I look at it is, if some, like, again, if something was to happen to me, my family's taken care of, that's great. If, let's say something happened to me or I'm long gone and people if people think of me and can see where I added value to their life that's enough for me because when I when I think about I I think the word legacy for me it's it's just it's just too maybe it's just too big of a word and then also I've seen like even recently how 
we have destroyed people's legacy because of what we now think in present day, we think of them in present day versus in the time that they were. And that we've we've misconstrued a lot of things. So for me, it's not about a legacy. If my my whole purpose to things is adding value to people's lives, whatever situation I'm in, the people I'm around, the business that I'm supporting, I want to add value. And if people can hold can can hold a memory that I added value for them in some particular way, big or small, that's enough for me. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then last, well, second to the last question, um, as far as books go, right? Because I oh, believe yeah. readers are readers. Is there a book that you, you know, you stand by that has been pivotal for you in your development, both personally and or professionally? So there's a lot of books, both like business type of books and fiction books. I, I do like reading, but on the business side of things, I had this, I think I got this book probably last year and it's Be More Strategic in Business. And it's by Dana Thomas and Stacey Bowl. And it's a really good book. And it's about, and I think it has a, it's a lot about leadership for for women as well and one of the things I like about it they talk about having a personal governance board or board of directors for yourself people that are trusted that you have in that circle and this is a really good book I really like this book it's very it's very well thought out and I like how the chapters flow so this is a good one that I go back to um I think I just I just have there's a lot of books one of my and this is this is it's not like a leadership book, but one of my favorite fiction books is Jane Eyre. And the reason why I love that book is because it it's it's a a young girl. It's telling from from Jane Eyre's point of view, a young girl from very very humble beginnings. She was mistreated, but she stayed true to who she was, and in the end. She she was able to have the life that she always wanted. During a part of that, she could have um, she could have compromised, but she did not. She walked away from what she what she loved because she did not want to compromise. But in the end, she was able to realize everything. And I think that's that's one of the things that oh, I I go back to that book all the time because. Where wherever you start and whatever happens in life, if you were true, if you know yourself and you're really true to that, that your own personal compass, you know who you are, you know what you want, you know what you believe, and you don't compromise, it can be some very difficult times in between. But I do believe in the end you will receive all that you ever wished for and that you ever wanted. I can totally relate to that. Um, I have not read that <laughs> book, but um, I will definitely add that to the list as well as be more strategic in business. We'll include those in the show notes. So thank you for those recommendations. And then last but certainly not least, where can the audience get in touch with you? Where can they connect with you if they want to learn more about the work that you're doing um, or just have conversations with you so that you can impact their lives positively? Oh, yes. So I'm on LinkedIn. That's pretty much the only social media platform that I'm on. I don't do Twitter or Instagram, but I'm definitely on LinkedIn. And I love having conversations with folks. One of the things that I do when I, I love speaking at conferences, which, which you know, and I love to have people who reach out to me and we can have those conversations because again, I don't, I'm not a hoarder of information. If I have something that you think is beneficial, that I can provide that in a short conversation, you know, with new people that I find, then I'm willing to have that conversation. I'm willing to to help you because one of the things that I noticed from the conference, there's a lot, there's still a lot of disruption in the learning and development space and the the pool, do, do we go back to the way it used to be or do we continue to, to shine and then push the, you know, try to push the organization forward and challenge people in this new way of, of really connecting with our employees. So there's a lot of struggle there. Some folks are having a lot of struggle 
with how to put that forward to the organization. So if I can add value, my thing, adding value, if I can add value, just um, connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, and I have some stuff, some posts and some papers on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email and I'm generally more than happy to, to have a conversation. Awesome. Thank you for that, Sonia. So we will include Sonia's link in the show notes as well. So be sure to check that out, reach out to her, let her know that you heard her on the She Leads Now podcast. With that, Sonia, again, I can talk to you for hours. Thank you so much (laughs) for the mic drops, for your wisdom, for even showing us kind of internally what's happening and what are some of the conversations and the planning that's that's taking place in organizations to better support employees. Because if we just looked at LinkedIn or we just looked at the headlines, we would think that, you know, HR and leadership, all of them, they've just abandoned employees, you know, and left <laughs> them on their own. So it's good to have this perspective to say, actually, no, we've been thinking about this. We've been putting things in place and they are they are creating an impact. Um, So thank you for that. And for the audience, thank you for joining us. I will be back next week with another amazing leader. Until then, have a wonderful rest of the week and we will talk soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. If you found today's episode helpful or got a piece of insight that you plan to implement in your business or organization, I would love to hear from you. Connect with me on LinkedIn at Sabine Gideon, that's my handle, and send me a private message or feel free to go ahead and leave a review on either Apple or Spotify. I also invite you to share this episode with anyone in your network who you think might benefit from this content. Lastly, be sure to check the show notes and the description below for links to resources, including relevant downloads, articles, and any upcoming training. Until we chat again, have a blessed and powerful week.